Through one game, the 2023 Tigers look a heck of a lot like the 2022 Tigers. That's both good and bad, so let's talk about it all coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. And if you ever need last minute tickets to a Mizzou game or any other event for that matter, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. And for all of the talk, coming into week one against South Dakota that is basically going to be a split between Sam Horn and Brady Cook and heck even Jake Garcia might get in there right a third quarterback anyway that was the talk of game week but I gotta be honest I I think we were a little bit misled by Eli Drinkwitz because the fact that Sam Horn did not get into that ball game until the second half. That tells me everything I need to know that Brady Cook is clearly your starting quarterback right now. The idea that there's a quarterback controversy, you can think that in your mind as a fan. You can think Sam Horn is better based off what evidence. I'm not really sure at this point. I think it's just basically hope and blind faith if you're thinking Horn is actually the better player. Folks, He's now a sophomore at Mizzou. We need to stop thinking about what his high school rankings were. We've we've forgotten already about what Jake Garcia's high school rankings are. So it's time to just put all of that aside with Sam Horn. And I'm not trying to be critical of Horn here. What I'm actually doing is being critical of Drinkwitz and the staff because if Cook really is the clear starter, okay, great. If you don't want to tell us that, fine. But... To me, in the second half, at the very least, what in the world is Missouri even trying to evaluate here? Let Horn throw the football. It seems like all Missouri wanted to evaluate in the second half offensively was, well, let's see if our offensive line can push around South Dakota in the run game. Well, they were pretty successful at that at times in the second half. If they weren't, you might as well just burn the program down, quite frankly. If you can't put a FCS, if you can't physically impose yourself on an FCS opponent that didn't get a single vote in the preseason top 25, then again, you've got massive, massive problems. So I know I sound frustrated here. It's mostly that I just think that Missouri looked arrogant yesterday it could, because some of you are going to sit here and tell me some of you are are going to tell me that well Missouri just didn't want to show anything offensively they're hiding everything for Kansas State in week three you know what defensively I can completely buy that I didn't see Missouri and listen I, I'm going to go deep into my film the next episode of this show in about 24 hours within the next day or so I'm really going to dive deeply into all this stuff gonna have a breakdown of the quarterbacks the defense and everything but just to my initial thoughts here my initial eyes I didn't think the defense did anything fancy whatsoever and why should they they're a good unit they have the same defensive coordinator from last year many of the same starters They pretty much know what they're doing, and I thought they did a pretty good job of it for the most part yesterday. Everything was fine defensively. But offensively, Missouri does not have the luxury, in my opinion, to just go out there and throw a bunch of swing passes like we did last year. A bunch of screens and that kind of thing. Just the same old stuff, quite honestly. Again, well, they want to hide it for Kansas State. Hide what? Hide what? Missouri was not good offensively last season at all. I'm sorry. You can say, hey, the last four games when Bush Hamden took over, they got better. Hey, fair enough. Old Bush is not here anymore. This is now Kirby Moore's time, and this team needs to figure out what it is. I'm just disappointed that we didn't get more to look at with Sam Horn and just this offense in general because if this offense is really good, as good as Brady Cook 
see confidently was talking it up. I, I just think we that team needs to see it on the field. They need to see that execution on the field. And again, they told us, the coaching staff told us yesterday by their actions, actions speak louder than words, that Sam Horn is really not an actual competitor for this job. Maybe he was at the start of fall camp. Maybe he was at the start of spring. But right now, Horn is obviously ahead. There is no real quarterback controversy right now. On the other hand, it does seem like there might be a kicker controversy. Blake Craig, I hope your leg is warm because Harrison Mevis missed a couple kicks yesterday. The first one from about 47 yards, I believe. And I was kind of going, eh. No big deal, right? No, you miss a kick occasionally. I'm not going to go crazy with that. It almost hooked in at the very end. But to miss from 35, that was really, really disconcerting because Miva simply just wasn't the same guy last season as he was the previous year. Now, on the positive side for Mevis, he handled the kickoffs. Obviously, we had a kickoff specialist the previous couple seasons with Harrison, but he booted those just fine. If I'm an NFL scout, I'm going, hey, the leg looks good. He got those into the end zone for touchbacks. No problem there whatsoever. Pretty deep into the end zone as well. However, for all the talk of Mevis dropping some weight, looking a little better, hey, looks a little bit better in his uniform. No problem with that. Whatever he's got to do, I just like to see the accuracy return because that's a bit of a mystery at this point. And you can no longer just say, well, that that Auburn kick, that was a fluke. Whatever happened last year is a fluke. It's now carried over into 2023. And again, that's one of the negative parts of what this team looked like from last year. Fortunately, the defense, again, looked about what, it, what I expected. So that's a positive. But offensively, in terms of special teams with Mevis, that looked a little bit more like 2022, much more like 2022 than I would have preferred. Now, one player who seemed to learn from last season was N Nate Pete, in my opinion. I had to laugh. In the first quarter, there was a run down the sidelines. Pete nearly scores, gets pushed out near the pylon. And, of course, I couldn't help but think back to the Auburn game where he fumbled that football by reaching out for the pylon to score. Well, Pete held onto that ball in his right arm for dear life. I couldn't help but laugh at that moment. Nathaniel, all's forgiven, buddy. Great great learning job. We, we love that you're holding on to that football. So forget about last season. It's all in the past. I really couldn't care less at this point because we are on to 2023. And Luther Burden certainly got a big start to his 2023 with seven receptions for nearly 100 yards and a score. Yeah, that slot position is going to result in him getting a lot of action as predicted here on this program. So I want to talk a little bit about what Luther can expect from the slot, including some more shots to the head, apparently. So let's talk about Burden, Makai Miller, the rest of the Missouri receivers, and all kinds of stuff. Going to empty the notebook here from yesterday's ball game. But first, I do want to tell you about game time because when you're looking for last-minute tickets, there's no better place to get them then game time. In fact, I hooked somebody up yesterday with the app, with my promo code, got them 20 bucks off on their tickets. They were delighted. It's really as easy as pie. You just find your event immediately, events right around your location, select your event, whether it's Mizzou, you get perfect views of your actual tickets so you know exactly what to expect before you get in your seats game time truly is the place for last minute ticket deals so download the game time app create an account and use promo code locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account redeem code locked on college for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed <laughs> College football is back, and this season, Locked On is stepping up their coverage with Locked On College Football kickoff live each Friday. Locked On will go live from 10 a.m. to noon Central Time on every Locked On College YouTube channel. That's College Football kickoff live. It'll cover playoffs, the conference rivalries, and go in-depth 
with Locked On experts like only we can. Your team every day. Find Locked On College Football Kickoff Live every Friday from 10 a.m. to noon on any Locked On College YouTube channel. You won't want to miss it. And you're not going to want to miss Luther Burden this season. I think he's going to have a massive, massive year. I think easily 80 targets, maybe even 100 targets are in his future. Got at least seven yesterday. I don't see his target number here on ESPN readily available, but seven catches for 96 yards and a touchdown. I thought one of Cook's best throws came on what looked like a bit of a post route of some sort to Luther Burden over the middle. A couple nice throws, I thought, to the sort of intermediate middle by Cook yesterday, including that touchdown pass. But Burden did take a shot to the head, got the targeting call. Uh, the kid was kicked out of the game for it. Well, to Luther Burden, I would say, hey, welcome to the slot, pal. There's a reason that the slot has become popular these days. It's because unlike back in the day, well, you're actually protected in that position now when you go over the middle on that play. Because back in the day when Ronnie Lott was prowling the prowling the middle for the San Francisco 49ers or Harold Piercy from Missouri back in the day, Basically, what I'm saying is safeties could take your head off legally over the middle. So a superstar player like Luther Burden, that was why they more or less did play on the outside back in the day. You could throw them the ball and, well, protect them at least a little bit. And now you're, everybody's protected over the middle. That's why tight ends can play a lot longer in the NFL than they used to. Boy, those guys just used to get absolutely murdered back in the day so for better or for worse I, I tend to think better that's how the game is these days so it, at the same time though what I'm trying to say is Luther Burden is still going to take some punishment over the middle if he takes that to the chest to the stomach even to the legs well you don't get your legs protected like quarterbacks do in the pocket so that is a real thing he is going to have to be ready for that physicality that that position demands but I think he's ready for it because not only is Burden really good in the open field, he, he's shifty, he can make guys miss, no question about that. He's a surprisingly well, sturdily built guy. For Again, for a slot receiver, for a five-star, you know, wide receiver, former guy, you'd expect him to be a little bit more slightly built. Well, I've stood next to Luther for a second or two, and one thing that stood out was like, you know, he's a lot more thick than you would have thought, and I mean that in a good way, not in a thicker kicker or Harrison Mevis way but in a oh this guy can actually run you over as well and, and absorb some contact as well as make you miss too so again I think this is a great fit for Luther Burden he's gonna have a huge season this year now because Burden is going to be lifting a heavier load it seems on offense this season and like I said from the slot you're maybe more likely to take some more punishment as well, you could argue that maybe Luther should take a break from returning punts. But in my opinion, he is special enough, has enough potential at that spot that's probably worth keep putting him back there. And well, also, he likes doing it. He wants to do it. So it seems like Missouri is probably going to try to keep Luther Burden happy for a whole bunch of different reasons. But when it comes to kickoff returns, I think Chris Abrams' drain is too important to be putting back there at this point. I just don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. I don't think we've ever seen that Chris Abrams' drain is some super above average kickoff returner, some special explosive player that we need to put him back there and risk what is perhaps the most important player on the Missouri defense. He's certainly in the top two or three, in my humble opinion, so... Again, I'm not saying I'm not trying to pick on Chris here and say he's a bad kickoff returner. That's not my point. I especially think, though, the way this game is played is as devalued as kickoff returning has become in our modern game here. You can fair catch the ball anywhere inside the 25 yard line and get it at the 20 or the 20. I'm already forgetting what the rule is. The NFL and college gets a little confusing on the 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 touchbacks at this point, but. But regardless, I, I just don't think it's worth Chris Abrams' drain, putting him back there, putting more stuff on his plate, risking potential injury, just putting more load on his body at a, at a position that 
again, in general, for the way kickoffs work, just is totally devalued, not nearly as important as it used to be. The, the rules are basically set up so you fair catch the ball every time. I would just have somebody else out there instead of him. Surely there's a third, fourth string running back on the roster, Tavoris Jones, Jamal Roberts. Apparently, we couldn't find ways to get them touches yesterday, which, again, I found sort of bizarre. Eli Drinkwitz's stubborn refusal to play young players in these types of, of football games continues to baffle me. But again, Chris Abrams Drain, you're an excellent corner. I would just leave him doing that. That's just my humble opinion. And, and one other thing on the kickoff return team that I noticed, Eli Drinkwood says he's been more involved in special teams now. Well, I would give him, I would send him a note across the room if I were in that special teams thing and say maybe we should rethink having realist George being sort of the first line of blocking there because it's not about his blocking it's not about that I understand the idea of oh we're gonna have this massive guy as sort of to to take out the first line of defense here for our kick returners my worry is and we saw this actually last season when Missouri had three guys who were non-skill players who were essentially defensive linemen being the first the first line of attack there in terms of blocking on kicks what worries me about that is when they is when the opposition boots the ball up in the air the sort of pop up kick where they make the first line of defense fair catch the ball i don't really want my 300 pound defensive tackles trying to fair catch the football that's just me so maybe again Get a line, get a tight end in that position. Somebody who is used to catching the football. You want to put Tyler Stevens out there? I'm fine with that. That makes some sense. Put a guy out there who has some size, who is a who is a blocker, by the way. But realist George, I just think that's a little bit risky for me. The last thing I want to do on a kickoff is muff it and turn the ball over. Again, the way kickoff rules go these days, you just want to secure the ball. That's your number one goal. And coming up, let's continue to empty this Missouri, South Dakota mailbag, including what I believe may be Desiree Reed Francois's first misfire when it comes to the fan experience coming up right after this. Well, I'm not going to bore you with my economic thoughts right now, but I will just say I am against society moving away from cash entirely again i won't get bogged down in that but specifically missouri now no longer accepting cash at furrow field and that's a real head scratcher to me i really don't understand who this is supposed to help it certainly didn't help move the lines along yesterday because while it wasn't a disaster by any stretch of the imagination the grab and go a beer line from my experience, but it was definitely slower than it was last year when you could just hand somebody a $20 bill for your two $9 beers and say, keep the change. Well, not only did the person get a couple quick bucks, you could just move the line along so much faster. What What is the point of this? I don't really understand, but for practical purposes, I will say, although I do sound like a grandpa wanting a world of cash, maybe to some of you younger folks, well, I do have an Apple watch on my arm. And what I figured out is, hey, use your Apple pay. That actually that transaction goes through a lot quicker than actually using the old school plastic. So, again, Apple pay, Android pay, whatever you've got there. That seems to be the way to go if you want to expedite this process. So let's let's spread that word. So. So we can all get drunk or faster, right, at Faro Field. But seriously, I, I just don't really understand this move. I think it really might be the first, the true misfire of the Desiree Reed Francois era here when it comes to the fan experience. But perhaps it'll get expedited. It'll all work out, and by the end of the season, I'll I'll say I was wrong and go. You know what? It's actually better without cash. Listen, I, again, I've got the Apple Watch. I've got all the, the payment methods in the world. I just don't understand why you'd take away cash as an option. What, what is the point of that? Somebody's got to explain the logic of that to me. And speaking of new stuff, well, the new clock rules in terms of, well, after a first down, you, you, may, you may have noticed this, you may not have. 
when you get a first down now in college football, the clock no longer stops for the referee to spot the football. That was a rule for years and years and years. I'm not even sure when that came into play, but decades now that's been the way college football has been played. Well, now it's much more like like NFL football. Now the clock only stops for those spots in the last two minutes of each half. And I got to say, I'm not really a huge fan of this because, well, what it does for practical purposes, I think on average, you're going to see about 10% less football than you otherwise would have. 10% fewer snaps than you would have in the old system. Again, it's much more like NFL football. We saw in the third quarter where South Dakota was able to get a few first downs, get a decent drive put together before Missouri ended up stopping them. But what happened is Missouri and Sam Horn only got the football with about six and a half minutes left in the third quarter, if my memory serves me correctly. So if you're a Chiefs fan like I am, occasionally you get frustrated if somebody like the Tennessee Titans is just running the ball, trying to keep the ball away from our our Lord and Savior, Patrick Mahomes. That can be frustrating at times. Well, that's what we're going to see here in college football much more. It's going to be a little bit easier for teams like South Dakota to keep the game just a little bit closer so I suppose it helps it helps maybe spur on a few more upsets on the margins I I suppose but to me if you want to make the games shorter you want to make sure your broadcast partners get their broadcast windows in just right that whatever the reasoning is there there are several ways you can shorten the game without actually having fewer snaps you could make halftime Go from 20 minutes to 15. God forbid you take out a TV timeout or two a half. And even more importantly, I think you could expedite or you could expedite replay, make that process faster. You could also limit it to where not every snap is able to be replayed. That's the benefit of coaches' challenges. And the way the NFL does is at least there is some limit on instant replay in terms of the time it takes or maybe just frankly eliminate it altogether. I, I, I'm sure that's probably not going to happen. But again, back to the pros, I'm old enough to remember a time where the NFL brought instant replay in in the early 90s and then abandoned it again for at least a decade or so, I believe, before obviously bringing it back in full force here in recent years. But it's not unprecedented for a sport to go, you know, this replay thing, we thought it was going to work. Let's get rid of it. It seems like in our micromanaging world, though, that we live in, that's not going to happen. But for entertainment purposes, it sure seems like we've sided with replay overseeing actual football. I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. But, hey, thanks for being a fan of this here program. Thanks for telling a friend that Locked on Mizzou is available wherever you get podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the whole deal, even ad-free for you prime people over on Amazon Music. So that's a great option as well. But you know what? On the next program, again, more on this Missouri-South Dakota game. Going to do a serious, serious film deep dive. and actually. Read about what some other people said about this game, too. I have not clouded my judgment with other people's thoughts yet, but I'm going to do it this afternoon, and I'll see you guys next time right here on Locked on Mizzou.